Welcome to Tulsa Time with Bishop Condorla. My name is Derek Lissy, and I am your host. Bishop, how are you doing this week? Good, good. Actually, today is the 12th anniversary of my mother's death. Oh, wow. So the Condorla children, you know, the mom and dad are both gone. The Condorla children have an active uh, texting and, and all of that. Recently, in fact, we started a group me. <laughs> just for the there you go for the family for the kids. well for the size that would make sense and yeah. uh, so on a day like this lots of messages flowing back and forth to to be present to each other and and uh, to remember her fondly so absolutely your your mom will be in our thoughts and prayers yeah. uh, this week um, yeah that's a uh, yeah, when the family is that large, the group me seems like it'd be more effective for. Well, for that's some of those the things. reason is because you can only go to a certain number of people on a group text. Do you have nieces and nephews in that and group? And trying to get oh nieces and nephews into it because some of them are old enough. Yeah, and we've got the great nieces and nephews coming on now, so. Oh man. Yeah. So. Yeah, you get out to forty, fifty people. It's, yeah. It's pretty hard. <laughs> well, we got Lent coming up, Ash Wednesday. Yeah, I don't. I didn't look to see, compared to how early it can come, how early it is this year, but it's pretty early this year because it's just uh, three weeks from now, is that it? February the... Um, 14th, St. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, that's right. February 14th. Yeah. yeah. So um, just a little over two weeks. It's great for me. You know, won't have to buy any chocolate. I'm sure Whitney won't care. You know, I mean, it's Lent. No, just... Well, <laughs> you know, that's the thing is that people will have to plan ahead. Yeah. Because, of course, Mardi Gras mm. is a typical traditional day of celebrating before Lent anyway. And this year you can celebrate Valentine's Day on Mardi Gras. Yeah. Because it'll be hard to celebrate Valentine's Day <laughs> on Lent. Although I was thinking... Uh, we have the heart candy, the little hearts candy, the little hard candies. And uh, one of them, of course, always says, be mine. And so you can give the be mine candies on Lent because that is what God is saying to us, be mine. And uh, that's right. we were joking about it that <laughs> you could summarize the whole Bible with the heart candy that says, be mine, <laughs> because... The whole Bible, all of salvation history is God saying, be mine. Um, and so Lent is, is uh, going to help us to do that, to belong to God. Yeah, Yeah. I wonder if that's an affectionate way one could go to their betrothed and to take some dirt or some ashes from the fireplace and mark their forehead, you know, be mine. You, know, it's... you could. You could try it. <laughs> Tell me how it works out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think... Uh, you know, I don't think I'm alone in looking forward to Lent. I like the yes. season of Lent. There is, I suppose, in a way, it's like summer and like winter. In the midst of winter, you're looking forward to summer. That's right. But uh, in the midst of summer, you're looking forward to winter. So uh, we live our lives all year, but knowing that we have that special season in which to really focus ourselves and to to really spend more time uh, thinking about that relationship that we have with God. Mm -hmm. Lent does that for us. Um, you know, Ash Wednesday is a day of fast and abstinence. And so... Again, that's why it's best to do the celebrating for Valentine's Day on Tuesday uh, because it's hard to, <laughs> to celebrate much while you're fasting and abstinent of meat. But those are some of the sort of the, uh, the standard rubrics, you know, that are always, yeah. we have to once again remind ourselves, okay, now wait a minute, what is fasting? What is abstinence? When do we do which? Um uh, fast, people know what fasting is. Fasting is is uh, eating less. Typically, we talk about it as eating two lesser meals that together would equal one meal. That's a rough guideline uh, on a day of fasting. You might have one meal and then two lesser meals that equal one meal. Uh, abstinence is abstinence from meat. You know, priests, of course, hear lots of people confessing, oh, I forgot to, 
to to not eat meat. Yeah. It's hard for that to be a sin. I mean, if a person is just saying, I don't care, I'm just going to eat meat. Right. Then, you know, there may be some volition in that. But when we're, it, it's a break from our normal routine, perhaps. And so if we forget, we forgot. I mean, sin has to have intention. And so uh, we can we can express sorrow for that at Mass during the, the penance rite anyway. And you can always simply fast or, or, or uh, abstain from meat the next day or something. Uh, now, you know, there's always the joke about um, the person who's abstaining from meat on Friday or Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Those are the two days of fasting. And then abstaining from meat all Fridays of Lent. And the person who goes to <laughs> the really high dollar seafood restaurant and orders a seven course lobster meal well right you didn't have meat but <laughs> is that really the kind of abstinence that lent is is advising us towards mm -hmm. and i would say to people that in terms of what we could call the discipline of lent approach it the same way that you would approach exercising in the gym if you pay you know if you Invest the money to have a membership in the gym. When you go there, you probably ought to try, you know, push yourself to work a bit. Mm -hmm. And so it's real easy to overdo Lent at the start of it <laughs> and then be disappointed and disgruntled yeah, by, the, yourself out. by yeah. the middle of it and give up. Yeah. And so then Lent becomes rather short for you man, this year I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do everything perfectly. And then you forget the first, you know, Ash Wednesday you forget and the first Friday of Lent you forget something and then you don't do your penance or whatever. And you've tried to do too much, mm -hmm. none of which God requires of you. And so then you, you feel so bad about not doing it that then you don't want to do it. You think, ah, I'm not doing this well at all. Well, we never want to do something we don't do well. We always are striving to do well. So I think it's a much more prudent approach to say, you know what, this year I'm going to ease into Lent, so to speak. I'm going to take on one or two practices. Uh, you know, we, we typically talk about what am I going to give up for Lent? And that's an easy thing to help kids understand. Simple minds, I could give something up. But I think that the, um, the wisdom that we hear, for example, from St. Francis de Sales, when he talks about uh, which cross should we accept, well, we should accept and look for the cross that's in front of us. The yep. cross that's in front of me is the person who's cutting me off in traffic and me not getting mad and thinking bad thoughts or worse about that person. Uh, you and I were talking <laughs> about the the cross that might be in front of a married husband of, with oh, children. Yeah, sure. sure, I could go to the gym and work out really hard. That yeah. would be tough, hard to do. That's right. But what I need to do is go home and be with the kids. Oftentimes I, oftentimes, I find in my own spiritual life that where I need to be is very obvious and right in front of me, what I need to be. But I always have these visions of grandeur, right? It's like, it's like, oh, if I could, oh, that guy's really interesting or that gal's really interesting. If I could evangelize that person and they could, you know, do this or that, or if I could... You know, or when I'm fasting, here's a great outlandish plan on how I'm going to, you know, give up meat for all of Lent every single day. And I'm going to, you know, kind of do that. And I'm going to do a holy hour every day and, and push too hard when in reality, I'm still ignoring my wife and kids, you mm -hmm. know, every night or, or, you know, not paying attention to where I need to be. And sometimes it's really obvious when you get down to the basics of where you should be focusing or refocusing. Um, my experience and my best Lents have been where I have shedded away something mm -hmm. that is a bad habit or just usually time wasted. 
And time can be wasted doing a lot of good things. Yeah. And especially as a married guy with kids, I'm always choosing between two goods. Just mm -hmm. I'm choosing the lesser of two goods, you know. Right. Um, you can go exercise or you can go read a good book or you can do. But the truth is, is you may only have two hours in the evening with your wife and kids. So what's your impact going to be? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you want to take that time? Do you want to take it, you know, ignoring them? And so and it's not always that black and white, you know, every day, you know, right. but oftentimes it's something simple. So I think that's kind of what I think that's consistent with what you're talking about. And yeah, that's what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, it, it, it helps us to understand that, you know, look, giving up chocolate. OK, that's one thing. Then that's, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. That may be a wonderful thing. But if I don't change my life and I just give up chocolate, I'm not going to accomplish much. I might lose a couple of pounds. But what Lent <laughs> Depending is, on how much chocolate you yeah, eat, I guess, how much regularly. You eat. Yeah. What, what Lent is striving for is that we would become more uh, like the Lord, that we would become closer to Him, and it's really my sins that are going to be keeping me from him. And so when I think about what should I give up in Lent, I should give up things that separate me from God primarily. And so if I'm short with my coworkers or, um, you know, I don't spend enough time with my children or something, those would be the places to start. Uh, Lent is about conversion. And... I was reading this in the in the Ordo, uh, where it talks about uh, the uh, attitude during Lent is compunction, compunction, which contains within it the word puncture, the the root of the word puncture, mm. and that don't we all of us don't we have somewhat inflated egos that need to be punctured? Yeah, and so. We're allowing God during the season of Lent by the discipline that we take on for the season to puncture our egos, to grow our humility, and it is that humility that's going to help us to draw close to the Lord. Um, yeah, oftentimes during Lent, that, that process of, of shedding things away of, is this process of, of conversion. Many people would call it conversion, you know, and as we you know, sort of grow in holiness or grow in greater con conversion, you know, bishop as a, as a priest or as a bishop, how do you, how do you know that you're on the right path when it comes to your path of conversion? You know, we know prayer, fasting, almsgiving, but how do I, yeah. how do I, how do I base my decisions in, in what I'm giving up and what I'm going after to make sure that I'm on the path to Christ and not, you know, sort of on the path to my own, being my best self or being pr proud and how I can mm -hmm. fast or can I can do so many corporal works of mercy that I, you know. Well, compare yourself to others. That's the best way to do it. Make sure you're doing more stuff than they're doing. Yeah. That's right. That's no. right. Um, <laughs> you know, perhaps a good place to start, because part of our conversation today should, should talk about the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, mm. uh, to think about our last confessions, our last numbers of confessions, uh, what have we been confessing? Because whatever we've been <laughs> confessing, that will give us a range of, of places to start in terms of what should I give up. If I'm uh, always confessing being um, short-tempered with my family, maybe I should give up being short-tempered or lashing out at people or learning new methods of being patient and some and extra so focus in that area is almost maybe a good way to talk about where we fast what mm -hmm. we give up you know right. like put some extra attention on that mm -hmm. if that's a habit because you know if a person does serious fasting uh you know five days a week but their family is paying the price for it yeah because you know now they're really a bear to be around that's not helping so don't do that. Uh, what we do during Lent should make us easier to love, easier to be around, not harder. So that gives us an idea where to start. Uh, it is 
it is in that relationship with the Lord, in that prayer, uh, I think probably most of us can use additional time for prayer. Not hours, I'm not talking about hours, just some additional time. Uh, Our lives today are surrounded with these devices that are so helpful to us, but most of us find that these devices are also quite distracting, and they have a pool all their own. I want you to spend time with me, looking at me, and so forth, which is keeping us from other duties or better things to spend time with or or prayer even. So again, that's another place for us to start. Uh, One of the things that happens during Lent, and that is certainly highly recommended during Lent, is the the use of the sacrament of reconciliation to make a good confession. And one of the practices that's just become sort of a standard practice in the U.S. anyway, and probably in most places in the developed world, uh, is this idea of penance services. So mm-hmm. the whole deanery or, or vicariate of priests will try to gather at one location, and everybody's invited to come and uh, have their confession heard. But I would recommend for people to make a different uh, time for confession. You know, confessions are offered regularly and even more times, usually during Lent. Because if you go to a penance service, you're going to be there with a lot of other people, and that means you're going to have very little time. And there may be a lot of distraction because there's so many people there. Uh, Much better would be sort of the standard noon confession at the cathedral or the Saturday afternoon confession or meeting Father in his office or whatever. Uh, And then that's easier to do. Uh, It takes a little bit of planning. Mm -hmm. but easier to do, uh, quieter, less distracting. But to make a good confession uh, is certainly a a valuable practice during Lent. The other thing that we we like to talk about tonight, I'm going to go visit the uh, OCIA uh, people at St. Benedict's. OCIA, you know, we've now changed from the right of Christian initiation of adults to the order of Christian initiation of adults. And uh, my, my purpose tonight, or the reason they invite me, is just to come and share some encouraging words with them and have a meal with them. But a big part of Lent for the church is to be focused on and praying for our catechumens and our mm-hmm. candidates. Uh, those catechumens are the people who have not been baptized and so who are converting to Christianity, who are becoming Christians. Cat- candidates are not uh, converting to Christianity. They are typically already Christians. They've already been baptized, uh, in usually, in another uh, church community. And now they are coming into full communion with the church. So that's, that's different than saying they're converting. Uh, so it's important to, to use you know, the language that fits what they're doing. But uh, this is a very special time for them because this is their final Absolutely. preparation. They've been going for weeks and months, but now this is a focused time of preparation for them. When I was in uh, campus ministry, we typically had about 60 people at the Easter Vigil, uh, 20 or so of whom we were baptizing, and all of them we were confirming, and it was just such a special celebration. you know. Absolutely. As somebody who's been going to confession... Um, luckily with some regularity in my, my whole life, thanks be to God for my parents and their influence on my life, especially because when you're a kid, you know, you're just, we're just kind of floating, you know, mm-hmm. um, anyways, but, um, so thanks be to God that, that that's been happening in my own life. But some of the better conversations I've had with priests have actually been in the confessional when I've had time. But what would you say to somebody who hasn't been to confession in a while? Cause I think for a lot of folks, the idea or the modern man who knows nothing about reconciliation and the gift that it is. I mean, we talk about the Mm. church as a gift. This is a gift. Um, But I think to the modern culture, they would probably not see, they would be like, oh, this is some weird accountability thing in the Catholic church, or Mm -hmm. I don't know, or this is some way for the priest to, you know, know things about you or something like that. But, But what would you say to somebody who hasn't been in a while or who thinks, sees it as daunting or maybe has these sort of modern 
false takes of, on what confession could be. Yeah, our natural sense of shame plays a lot in that. A person who has been away for a while and then becomes aware of the fact that I've been away for a while and, gosh, I don't want to go tell them that it's been 10 years or 50 years yeah. or whatever it is. Or a person who has, uh, in the past, committed some grave sin that they're very ashamed of. Same thing. They can be very sort of dreading ever sharing that with anyone. Uh, for such people to, to allay their fears, one thing is to remember that confession can be done anonymously. Mm. And pastors are supposed to see to it that their confessionals are set up in such a way that a person can either go face-to-face -face if they want or they can go anonymously. Uh, so that's one thing to remember. Another thing that sometimes puts people off is I, I've, it's been 10 years, I don't remember how to do it. Nowadays, you can literally get an app on your phone mm -hmm. that has the whole rite of uh, reconciliation in it yeah, And so all the prayers are there, and the priest is not going to think you're strange if you come in with your phone and you're looking at your phone. And Now, if you've got Facebook pulled up, he might, but <laughs> if you're... Let me tell you about my friend, Bob. <laughs> this guy's a crazy man. If you're using... You think this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> if you're using the Hollow app or one of those yeah. to, to make your confession, he won't. Uh, and then finally, to remember, the priest is a sinner. The priest himself has a confessor and goes to confession. The bishop does. I have a confessor. I go to confession. So uh, the priest, you know, he knows, I mean, he's heard everything. By the time you've been ordained a year, you've heard everything, <laughs> you know, I mean, basically. Uh, and so he's not going to be shocked by anything. He's not going to think, oh, my goodness, uh, about anything. Uh, for priests, being the minister of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which is so healing in people's lives, even just on the ordinary psychological level, let alone on the level of grace and the soul, uh, that's such an important part of the ministry that priests are just so moved often. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of post-abortion healing work when I was in, in Texas, and priests regularly will hear the confession of someone who has had an abortion in the past. Often it's been a long time, uh, even decades in the past, and they've been carrying that with them all this time. And to be able to be the minister, the person who meets that person when they finally, through the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, finally have the courage to come in and say, this is what happened, this is what I've done. Uh, is such a moving moment for the priest that I'm just so pleased to be there. I feel so honored uh, to be there. So, so, you know, to try to allay and put those feelings to the side, to focus on the Lord Jesus who, is you, who you're talking to, uh, the priest is sort of the conduit that Jesus uses, but Jesus is the one who forgives your sins. The priest is going to absolve you. Uh, and then to go, uh, just to, to go. And then to go regularly after that. You know, that's an important thing. And again, technology can help. You can put a recurring reminder in the phone, for example. Set it for every two months or whatever regular yeah. interval. We and have a monthly one. on That's a random Saturday of the month. Yeah. We have. yeah. And it will beep however you set it. And then you'll be reminded, okay, it's time. And then you can... Pick a day in your calendar and that's right. And make a, a plan to go. Once you're going regularly, then it really does become a helpful part of your spiritual growth and your spiritual life because you can begin to notice what are those things that regularly trip me up, and let me begin to really focus on those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I have a note that I always keep, and so I have a sort of a running record of 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 sins to some extent. I mean, not. Not a full list, but something I use because I always find I I don't know if it's just getting older or or what, but it's just hard to remember, you know. Even from your daily prayer, you know, you may pray every morning throughout the week or do a daily mm -hmm. exam, and then all of a sudden you get to Saturday and you're like, 
sometimes I feel like I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know what, Father, I'm forget. There is something that I was going to say. And I always feel bad too, because I always find myself just trying to speak as fast as I can. I'm like, all right, there's a line out there. I'm like, okay, let's start from the top here. It's been a month, you know, and then I start kind of navigating. And the this. priest appreciates that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and it, there's a human element, right? You know, you're like trying to help him out, you know, you're trying to go. And so then sometimes I'm like, all right, did I get it all? Did I get it all? And so, I will say it is nice to schedule an appointment mm -hmm. once you work up the confidence to do that. Because yeah. then there is none. Does it probably takes the same amount of time, right, to actually you know go through the sacrament as it does when you're when you're there on a Saturday. But you're not in a rush, you right? Know, and you're just relaxed. And um, and Father is, is in the same boat, you know. And so, um, but that's been my experience, you know, when it, you know with it. And uh, but I always I always have a sticky note of uh, a a Apple sticky note in my Apple notes of, you know, of last dates and stuff like that. And it is nice because then your date is in there. Everything's dated when you've edited it and stuff like I, that. And I so. can tell you it's the worst experience of all as a priest to be hearing confessions. This happened all the time at A&M. You're hearing confessions for an hour and a half before the 5.30 yeah. Saturday evening mass. And now it's 5.32 and you've heard this confession and you have to poke your head out the door and tell the four or five or eight people that are still in line, they've yeah. been there for an hour and a half waiting, working uh, their way through that line. And you have to say, I have to go. It's 532 masses already. Oh, that's always terrible. I would always tell them, look, I can hear your confession after mass if you like. But of course, they may not have time to wait. And people were usually gracious. But oh, I always just hated if I couldn't get to everyone, especially if they've been waiting a long time, I always hated that. So yeah, to to find an off time or if the priest is able to schedule a time, many people do have, and, and by design and plan, uh, do have a regular confessor, mm -hmm. a priest that they have formed a relationship with over time, who they simply go to this person always when they need to go to confession, usually. And the, 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 what's helpful about having a regular confessor is you have this history. So this person begins to get to know you, understands the, the uh, trials that you deal with, and can begin to give you some spiritual advice about, uh, let's try this. Have you tried this? What about this? Maybe there's other things to do. Or can uh, suggest you resources. Maybe you're struggling with a particular thing. Have you read this? Uh, book or this document or this spiritual treatise uh, that d deals with that, that can mm -hmm. be very helpful. So uh, that's something that people can consider as well. Yeah. Back to Ash Wednesday, I always, you know, being that Ash Wednesday is the start, it's always, it's just Ash Wednesday is sort of like a, a phenomenon, something I didn't realize when I was a kid. It's a cool phenomenon. I mean, just like how many people go to Ash Wednesday Mass. <laughs> it's so cool. Who some aren't even Catholic. Yes. I mean, just people. Absolutely. When I was living in Chicago for a time, I mean, a more Catholic place than as far as per capita than uh, in Illinois in general compared to Oklahoma. But, you know, you'd get on the train on Ash Wednesday and there's just random people who aren't Catholic giving ashes to people on the train, on the platform, to people who maybe are or aren't Catholic. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just wild. And our yeah. churches are packed on Ash Wednesday. Yes. And, you know, and then there's the memes and social media and everybody's posting and it's hashtag get your ash in mass and, yeah, yeah. you know, all the stuff. And so it's just it's just become kind of a phenomenon now. And it's wild. And, you know, and I'm... You know, we're our our family text, not a group me. We're not that big yet, like the Condorlas. But, you know, we, you know, everybody's got to send their selfie. You know, right, their right. Ashes with their with their kid. You know, and here <laughs> I am with my you know daughter, and my son, with their ash on their forehead. So I don't know. It's just kind of interesting, but it's also funny to me because it's become this sort of fun thing because of it's funny because of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And what we're being reminded of, mm -hmm. you know, you are dust until dust you shall return, you know, and it's taken from Genesis, um, you know, that message uh, that we will we will die. We will die. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I just think it's interesting. But but I think that it points to the power of liturgy and of sign and symbol. Oh, yeah. The wisdom of of Catholicism 
in the use of sign and symbol in its liturgy. The fact that uh, at A&M, for example, uh, we would schedule 13 masses, uh, several on campus in the big Rudder Auditorium that would hold six or 800 people, uh, several all day in our church and in another chapel that was on campus. And we would bring in extra priests to help us. And we would have these 13 masses and they would all be jammed. And how do you explain that? Because you're seeing people who don't regularly oh, yeah. come to church, uh, people who are not Catholic, etc. And it's not a holy day of obligation. You don't have to go. People right. are just amazed to learn that, really, Ash Wednesday is not a holy day. It's yeah. not a holy day. And uh, when you go, someone is going to rudely, if it happened any other day, you would think it was rude. Someone is going to rudely mark your head with dirt and tell you, you're going to die. Uh, <laughs> <tell> you, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> remember that you are dust and dust, you will return. And I always was struck by the experience as a minister of parents bringing up their little babies, newborns. And I'm marking this little newborn who's just started life. That's right. And telling the little newborn, remember that you are dust and unto dust you will return. Mm -hmm. And the parents want that to happen. Right. And are happy that it's happening. And again, the power of liturgy, there is... There is within us this natural uh, animal knowledge mm. that we won't live forever. It's something we typically don't think a lot about, at least not in the early part of life. Uh, and yet, when we are able to do something that is religious and liturgical, that puts us in connection with it, but also connected to hope, connected to eternal life, the hope of eternal life, it has a powerful, powerful draw. Uh, people would often, you know, show up. Every pastor has experienced it. People who don't come to the Mass, they could show up in between Mass. Father, could I get some ashes? They don't know much, but they know that I'm supposed to get some ashes. And they, don't, they wouldn't probably be able to give you a reasonable explanation of why they even want to do that. They just know that they should, yeah. such is the power of it. So it's really important, of course, for pastors and all ministers to use that opportunity. It's a really rich opportunity to evangelize people, not to chastise people about not coming, not to joke yeah. at people or make fun of people for not coming. Um, one year, a, a couple of students showed up, a young man and a young girl, in between masses, and I'd never seen them before, so I don't think they were regular mass goers or anything. Uh, Father, we, we weren't able to get here for the mass. Could we receive the ashes? He's wearing a T-shirt, this guy. <laughs> he was wearing a T-shirt that had on the front of it this really aggressive eagle that's nice coming at you with the claws. <laughs> and on the back of the shirt, it said something like, if you don't love the red, white, and blue, you can kiss my, and I'm not going to finish the finish phrase. This phrase. Yeah. And I thought, yes, he's coming so that I can mark him with a sign of humility. <laughs> Humility and hope and trust in the Lord while wearing that shirt. <laughs> I thought, yes. So he's not putting everything together, but we're going to use what we got. Here he is. We're going to use yeah. what we got. Absolutely, I can give you, uh, mark you with the ashes, because that may help him. Mm. Uh, that experience, and that may be the first time that he finally connects. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't wear something like this at all, let alone, uh, you know, on a holy day or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we have to use the opportunity. Uh, it needs to be a day of invitation. Come one, come all. Uh, we're going on this journey, 40-day journey. Come with us. It's going to be amazing. 
Uh, it's going to bring us all the way to uh, Easter. Uh, we'll, of course, do a Tulsa time about Holy Week and Easter, you know. Mm. One of the things that's profitable to do on Ash Wednesday is to look ahead for Easter week, Holy Week, and to see, can I make some plans? How do I get off work? How do I get some time? How do we get the kids? Can I make some plans to be able to attend those amazing liturgies? Absolutely. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, uh, the Vigil of Holy Saturday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday. Uh, can I make plans to be there? Because those are really rich, those mm. liturgies. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, a priest once told me he saw a shirt of a guy on a college campus that said, uh, uh, your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> and uh, I always think about that because it was, it was within a homily around around Lent, you know, in this opportunity to be to be humbled, you know, and to uh, during the time of, of that season and stuff. You know, you you brought something uh, that I think is really important to the table, which is like planning out Lent. You know, you might not want to go on vacation during Lent. You know, you might not want to plan as you plan ahead, you know, mm -hmm. think about yeah. you know, all those things. I always have to think about like my wife's birthdays during Lent, my son's birthdays during Lent, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, St. Joseph's, my patron, his feast days during Lent, yeah. you know, up more. So like all three of those things, they happen every year during Lent, pretty much no matter what. Yeah, yeah. And so just like thinking about how do I feast well? How do I, you know, where are the days, you know, I mean, Sundays, those week to sort of lay back, you know, are not really an option for me. Mm -hmm. I try to kind of adjust as I go. Um, but I think the, uh, I think, I think planning is important. I think mm -hmm. scheduling those things out, you know, looking ahead to the high holy days, but also like during kind of the, the season, you know, figuring out what our schedule is going to be so it's conducive to sort of where our aim is, which is ultimately right on Christ. So the um, doesn't spring break fall during Lent? I guess it pretty much always does. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot of people travel over spring break. Well, let me where are we going and where's the church near where we're going? That's right. You know? Uh, what days are we going to be there? Can we make sure that we can get to Mass on the days we need to get to Mass? Mm -hmm. uh, all of that kind of thing. Uh, how will I? Re what kind of reminder will I use to remember on Fridays to abstain from meat, for example? Mm -hmm. You know, where a bunch of us are going out to lunch at, from work or something. Well, how do I make sure that I remember? Okay, let's see. Can we go to a fish place or something? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so I look forward to it. Um, Lent is that, uh, that trip into the desert, you know, and uh, the desert is a stark place, but it is beautiful when you sit still and look. It's not beautiful if you try to rush through it, because then you're missing everything. Mm -hmm. It's when you sit still and notice that, oh, wow, there's... It's, there's, it's not that there's nothing here. There actually are a couple of plants. I've never seen that plant before. Look at it. It's growing there in the middle of nothing. Uh, oh, look, there's this little creature. I've never seen that little creature before. What is that? Yeah. So we have to slow down. Well, that's what Lent wants us to do, is to slow down and to explore this relationship that we have with God and with others and see how can we go deeper in it, all of it. Hmm. Well, this has been Tulsa Time with Bishop Condorla. My name's Derek Lissy, and we hope you all have a very blessed Lent. Bye.